Hello and welcome to LEC Post Game Lobby. I am I'm incredibly blessed tonight. I am joined by three wonderful guests. I've got Papa Smithy, Broxer, and Bwipo here, fresh off your win against Schalke. Uh, we talked a little bit about it in the pregame. It on paper seems like a, a pretty close matchup, but you, you didn't make it look that close. It was a, a very dominant performance from you guys. Um, I've got a sort of a broad question here because we've seen Reckless now play Karma four times. Does he like playing Reckless? Sorry, does he like playing Karma or is he just kind of like, ah, I'll play Karma, it's fine? I mean, I, I honestly... Be honest, boys. Be honest. <laughs> I think he genuinely thinks it's one of the better bot laners because I think it's pretty unanimous that AD carriers are a bit iffy right now and you need to have the right situation for them, whereas Karma, Universal Champion, you can play it in pretty much every matchup and at the very least farm, right? Which, again, it, it is a strong suit. Uh, I don't want to downplay him here by saying farming is what he's like best at, but really, he's a really smart player that knows how to take the scaling champion and be relevant in the late game. And guess what? Karma is exactly that. And it gives that auto priority, right? It gives that ability to push, to control the lane, very hard lane to actually dive and kill. So you can kind of leave it on an island and it'll probably be fine. You can try to turret dive it depending on the jungler and it can be fine. So you understand why he goes to it, but I know other fans are looking for the Tristan server that are, you know, <laughs> around the corner, hopefully. I think he enjoys just, you know, taking a step back sometimes and, you know, stepping out of the spotlight and just shielding people and kind of chilling in the back line. What do you prefer? Because you're just on Ivern, much more on the shielding <laughs> side. Like, do you like getting in there and ganking hard on the lease? And like, if you had to choose, like, lease and Ivern, two kind of different well, camps of jungler? Well, I'm not going to lie. It felt a bit weird today being on Ivern after playing a lot of Lee Sin games recently. Um, but I don't know. Sometimes it's kind of fun, you know, to be in a different position and, and have an entirely different play style for, for a game or two. And... Yeah, I mean, I don't mind, obviously. I do prefer my aggressive junglers, but here and there, it's, it's all right to, to worry about the Ivan, I would say. Interesting uh, that, obviously, Bwipo, you weren't really out of your comfort zone here. You had, you yeah. had yeah. Aatrox. <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure why the champion is still open. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but but that's, it, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing, because I looked at that draft that you guys had, and I thought, this, yeah. this looks like a really comfortable draft for Fnatic. What yes. was going through your minds when you were like, Hilly being hard targeted in the draft? And you were like, wait a second, we just kind of got everything that we want. Did you just go into that game thinking, this is, this is great. Like, I, I'm so happy with the outcome of this draft. Uh, I mean, I think on 4-5, on we were a bit worried that they were going to last pick support and get a really good matchup with Illusion, right? Mm. That's a bit scary. So I was like, hmm. But then they 4 pick Nautilus and were like... Yeah. So they even threw that out of the window, right? And then last pick Cannon, like, I feel like at this point, there is something better for... We banned the Camille. Uh, I was a bit worried about maybe a Fiora or something with the Sichuani melee synergy. There's the Kled coming up with the anti-healing buff, right? Just something in terms of, of, of you know, synergy with the Sichuani and then attacking the Aatrox. But the Kennen doesn't really bring either. I know yeah. my take looking at the draft, kind of where it was, the Blitzcrank did seem right because, of mm. course, the Karma interaction now is so preferential yeah. for the Blitz. So the ban came through there. And then when I saw the Nautilus... I was thinking about where you could go. And like you mentioned, if this is like Khan, it's going to be a Fiora, right? That was super yeah. likely there. To me, and we were talking about this off air, it's, it's yeah, the yeah. on-hit cannon. I assumed it would be just to try to at least attack Aatrox in the lane and kind of yeah. keep it on a lower health mm -hmm. bar. Yeah. But you guys and, and the EU analysts are really off the hype train on the on-hit cannon. Just, just what is it about it, do you think, that just doesn't translate? Is it the, the meticulous macro mm. that Korean teams talk about <laughs> that I don't really believe in? But no. what is it about um, it? I feel like it's a, it's a mentality thing, right? When you pick on-hit cannon, you are kind of relying on pure skill, right? You don't really have a button to press like AP a cannon button, does, right? Yeah, yeah you, you enter the whole game, you run mid, you press your R button, you get a five-man stun, there's hope. AD cannon, you fall behind, it's all on you, right? You have to right-click your way out of the situation. As well as the scaling, it's purely based on skill, right? You need to be able to use the stuns, know what you're doing. We see insane highlight players, uh, uh, plays from some of the Korean cannons because they're really, really good at this, right? But again, in a game like this, if you don't know what you're doing on the side lane and you decide to walk into a 5v5 with the on-hit cannon, it's lost. So, so what you're saying here is that e EU top laners and uh, are not. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> not I, think, I, think, I think they're capable of playing it. It's just, in general, I feel like there's always a dispute of what region thinks what champions are actually good. Yeah. There's always this mix, right? For example, I've been obviously a, a huge advocate of Aatrox the whole entire way through. And I know LCK has liked Aatrox for a very long time, but I know it dropped priority in different regions uh, over basically the year that he's been viable. But uh, I feel like there's always this one or two picks that are like a bit niche. 
to a region, and I feel like on-hit cannon is definitely in the, in the Korean era. I actually have a follow-up question to ask. It's kind of related to the point Lido was making about, like, everyone plays Azir Korki mm -hmm. because they're scared of, of yep. moving forward. Like, obviously, you are playing the Rengar and trying to lead and fly yep. the flag on that. And <laughs> you get a lot of flack when it loses and probably yeah. some begrudging kind of like, well, yeah. you know, the Rengar mains are DMing you, I guess. If <laughs> no, 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 no DMs? Oh, no, I mean, they would be happy, right? <laughs> <laughs> nice, you make my champion look like but, crap. <laughs> that's fair. But, but at the end of the day, like, where do you lie on that debate? Because... I've mm. heard that a lot of pro players don't innovate because they're afraid of the flame mm. if the thing that they brought to the table and got right. okayed yeah. didn't work. Like You're playing the Rengar, right. so that's already something, but <laughs> yeah. where do you lie on this kind of debate? Um, I feel like it's team-specific. You gotta find what you work for your team, right? Like for me, I notice um, we needed some physical damage in the top lane sometimes against champions like Nico, Kennen. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know where to look, right? So check up some win rates, level look. Guess what? Rengar's beating every single range champion in the top lane, so... You know what, maybe he's worth a shot. Uh, but even that, like, I heard you say that two weeks ago on the Alice Desk. Yeah. It made a lot of sense, right, on the show. It made a lot of sense, and it tracked one-to-one. Mm. -one, and yet, you're still volunteering a pick that other people look at and think of as a troll pick. You know, we had the OP or end it, earlier yeah, today, I mean, and people it, were pretty lopsided yeah, on that I one. Mean, so. it, it, it's, it goes both ways, right? Your team has to accept it. It has to be something that obviously has a bit of working or working in scrims. Yeah. It's not my first pick that I've tried out in scrims. I went a bit iffy. So <laughs> you want to like... name anything? How's the Garen looking? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a similar champion, actually, that I've been playing a bit. Uh, if anyone does a bit of scouting, it's Singed, right? Uh, I play playing modern solo queue, and it's like, it's the same type, right? Like, Singed can work. It can be a really good champion if you if the game goes the way it should, but um, it doesn't always. And my point on the on-hit cannon is this type of champion, you feel really useless, even if your team, like if your team is losing and you're really fed, you still can't do anything, right? You're reliant on your team at the end of the day and you need to have that pressure to be able to carry a game start to finish. And I can see why some EU top laners have a bit of ego, much like me, and I'm like, ah, but guys, I was super <laughs> strong, uh, but I can't team fight. And then you're like, ah, I can see why people don't play it. So we actually have the Kia player of the result, uh, the Kia player of the game results here. And uh, Broxa, you right. have won again. 44% of the vote so. <laughs> going your way uh, for the Kia player of the game. I think it was a close, uh, a close affair, though. Obviously, 44%, three choices, just pipping over the mark. I think you were in the mix there as well, Whippo. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah I, think you, I think it was you. Uh, I think it was definitely you two. I can't remember the, th the final choice, but... Uh, Hillisang was the final one. Mm. So yeah, but, but Broxa pips the mark there. Yeah. Uh, there has been, uh, this is an interesting question, Broxa, because uh, from just reading online sometimes, there's been a, a little bit of sort of people raising questions. I mean, we go back to spring last summer, Broxa was the golden child of the jungle, right? He comes, he comes in, can't do any wrong. People have been sort of raising questions. They've been saying, oh, is, is Broxa like that good? Is Broxa, you know, like the, the, the sort of the standout player? I think you've just shown there that you obviously are still one of the best junglers in Europe. Uh, it, has there been a point throughout the split where your confidence has been, has been a little bit lower, maybe because of this or otherwise? Actually, it's kind of interesting for me because one of the, the things that people were talking about coming into the split was how confident I was going to be, especially now with a substitute jungler coming in, how good I'm going to look. Um, you know, there were so many rumors and, and questions about me, but actually I'm still really confident that I've been the entire time. And... Um, I don't know, I feel like one of the things that's interesting about the jungle role is that people from the outside never really know what exactly the jungler is bringing to the team. Like, for example, I can look at G2 and I can say that, wow, Jankos is playing really well. Um, and he is, like, he's playing amazing, but I don't know, you know, what exactly Jankos brings to the team and how, you know, like, it's just so much harder to judge a jungler from the outside than the other roles, I feel like, and there's so much depth into it. And then, at the same time, some analysts think that you should play jungle a certain way, some things you should play another, and I don't know. Um, I've changed off my play style a little bit this split. Um, in, in spring, you know, we were not really getting the success we needed, and we decided to change the strategy up a bit. Um, I talked to the coaches about it, and we agreed on, okay, let's try to... Um, mix up our jungling style a little bit for the split and see how it goes. And to be fair, it's been working really well for the most part. There was like one or two games that were not ideal, but for the most part, it's been working. I actually have a question, because as a jungler, there's some games where your start's not ideal, mm. like maybe trick this game where he tried to invade, yeah. didn't get the buffs, and had to have a crappy jungle path that's not ideal. How do you communicate to your team that you're way behind where you usually are at a certain point. How do you pick yourself up when like the early game just didn't go to plan at all? Because whether it's like a mental thing or whether it's just a, by the way, all those trades we practice aren't going to work because I can't be there when I usually am there. Like, how do you reset when the early game doesn't go your way, which is probably like, you mm. know, one out of five games is just all over the place. What do you do? I think something that's really, really important for a jungler is to be like, 
really, really stable in a lot of ways, like kind of be the rock of the team. And even if you're put in the dirt, you need to be able to, you know, tell your teammates that, okay, guys, I am in a rough position See right now. But, but as long as, you know, we, we play safe, we just try to play defensive for a moment, I'll climb back into the game eventually. And um, I also think, you know, even though I had the Silas game especially was a really bad one, but even in that game, you know, I ended up stealing a Baron despite having a, a bad game the entire way through. And many of these things, um, some of the smaller highlights and, and some of the bad games are not really being talked about, right? People, sure. people usually focus on all the negative things. I think one of the interesting things as a jungler is when you do your job well, mm. people don't really notice you doing your job well because yeah, exactly. the, you set the laners up a lot of the time and the laners take over. Uh, I'm interested in knowing like when you're in game, how does your decision making process happen? Do you get called out by the laners to come to a specific lane or do you have a certain plan in mind when you head because of the draft? Like what is your priority when you're going into a game and how do you make your decisions? It um, varies a lot from Game to game, I would yeah. say. Um, well, it's no secret that this split, me and Buibu have been playing a lot together. We've been killing a lot of top laners. And in some of the scenarios, it's Buibu saying, like, Broxa, look at top lane right now. Maybe if you're here in 30 seconds, we can we can get a kill. And sometimes it's me saying, like, Buibu, go in right now. I'm going to be there and we're going to kill this guy. And it kind of goes both ways. It's a bit of a balance. So sometimes, you know, it's the laners calling to make the plays. And sometimes it's, it's the junglers. But I think... Um, in general, the jungler is the one who's supposed to have the, the overview right of everything. And sometimes, you know, Buibu asks me to gang top, and I tell him that, you know, it's not happening. Like, my bot lane <laughs> needs me, so goodbye, my friends. <laughs> and and Buipo, as, yeah. as the top lane, obviously, you've just talked about that synergy mm. that you guys have built up in terms of that ganking, I guess, relationship, I suppose. <laughs> um, do you ever have like, a pressure on your shoulders when, when, when you, let's say, we go into a game and Brox invests all these resources into mm. you? Uh, do you have that pressure in the game thinking, if I don't perform here, <laughs> like, this is oh, I, I mean, again, it's 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 shared responsibility. Yeah. Ultimately, if I call for gang's top, I'm giving my jungler an opportunity. Is how I look at it, right? I'm giving him an opportunity. Broxa gets the chance to come top and maybe get something. If he doesn't, that's fine. He can still just go somewhere else. If someone else suggests an opportunity, but if not, if there's nothing better to do on the map, you might as well look for something. And that's sort of the the idea I have is like I at least want to have something to be doing, right? I want my jungler to be doing something, ganking top, bot mid, doing dragon. I don't mind. As long as we're proactive when we can be. Now, I want to bring up the standings, guys, because after this win today, you've obviously put yourself in secured second position. Uh, and we'll bring it up on the screen uh, for our viewers. But right now, you guys are 10 and 3 going into G2 tomorrow. If you beat G2 tomorrow, I believe you're either going to be top or joint first. And I think because of the way that the second half of the split works, I don't know exactly where it lies, but you, you basically have a real shot at putting yourself back at the top of the table over G2. Does that weigh on your mind a little bit? I mean, you guys would own the head-to-head, -head, right? Yeah. It would be 2-0 in, in yeah. summer split. That's so true. it would be, yeah. be clear first place there. I mean, what should fans, like, what should people expect coming in tomorrow? Because we saw a Garen game from G2. <laughs> we saw an Ivern game again. from Fanatic. I don't know if we'll see an Ivern or a I feel like there's a big Garen difference band. between an Ivern <laughs> pick no, and a Garen agree. Pick. But I mean, to some people there isn't, right? But I, I agree with you. I think I it's mean, super viable. Like, what, what, what should we think going in tomorrow as neutrals trying to understand what the matchup looks like? Because a lot's happened since the last time you two teams fell. Well, there will be blood. I think <laughs> okay. we're the two bloodiest teams in the LAC. We kill the most people, so I think for sure there will be kills. I think that's one thing to look forward to, at least I look forward to it, obviously. Uh, I love my trades. I love, I love taking fights. So, in general, I think it'll just be a lot of contesting, uh, but swingy. I, I do believe that whoever takes the advantage, the other team isn't out, but will be controlling the game for sure. I, kind of, I want to come back to this discussion with G2 because we have got some lock scenarios to talk about when it comes to the playoffs. Uh, and I'm just going to essentially read these off because it can get a little bit complicated. But if you win tomorrow um, and I think Rogue lose, you, no, if you win or Rogue lose, you're locked in for playoffs. So that's, that's the situation that happens there. Splice lock if they win a, tomorrow against Rogue. So you, mm. both you and Splice have a chance to essentially lock yourself in the playoffs. You have double chances because if Splice beat Rogue, they lock and then they lock you. So you basically get that, that given to you for free. Knowing how likely it is that you've secured yourself a playoff spot, um, does that make you feel more comfortable going into this matchup? Um, for us, 
all that matters right now is just to get top two, really, because with yeah. the new playoff system, getting top two is so important. That's yes. something we found out the, the hard way last split. Yeah. Where we were really close to actually entering top two. We didn't get it. Origin took the spot instead. And then we had a long fight to even get to the get to the semifinal match to begin with. And yeah, actually, you know, getting two shots at entering the final rather than one is really huge. And the team that has to go all the way through um, I think we had to play two best of fives before even playing the semi-final. You know, that's a, that's a lot of games and a lot of strategy you're showing to the opposing team right there. So um, getting top two is all that matters for us. And, well, we're we are pretty happy that we're not in the same situation as last split where we were <laughs> barely even getting to playoffs in the first place. Obviously, we haven't secured the spot quite yet, but it's, uh, it's looking much better at the very least. And I got one last question. Garen Top, OP or N, what we got here? Come on, we got two experts. OP or N on that Garen Top. I think it's Intent to Karma. <laughs> I'll give you that much. That's I'll give you that much. Come on, Boxer. You're, you're not uh, a Garen expert. If I see a Garen top in my solo queue game, I'm probably dodging. It's I real really, real 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 At least he could have done some research and realized that all the best Garen players play Predator. At the very <laughs> least. <laughs> Honestly, with Predator, there's hope for this champion. All right, we learned something today. There's Predator Garen. You just run someone out of Predator? Not, uh, Papi, you might be done here. I'm not 100% done with these guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's my last question. That's <laughs> all I got. Now I got everything I need. Pa Papa's I just silent for the rest of the here. Am I? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Analyst, by the way. I don't know if you guys saw the G2 Grabs interview where he basically came out and said that players and teams that aren't locked in for playoffs, it, it's creating a negative atmosphere, that race for playoffs, and it's causing poor performances in teams. Do you resonate with that? Has that been a weight on your mind? Uh, do you think it's an accurate statement? I'm, I'm just interested in getting your thoughts on that. I think in general, when you're when you're losing, it it creates a bit more tension in general because you you know you're in a bit of a tricky position and you know there's things you have to work out and, and improve on really fast to to start getting wins on the board again. Like even for ourselves, we had we had like a couple of pretty rough weeks compared to the start of the split where we won every game pretty convincingly and. Um, obviously, it's not as bad as being at the bottom and, and losing most of the games. So at the same time, you know, after losing a, a couple of games in a row, you kind of realize that you know this is not working, and then you need to figure out what what the next step is going to be. There might be some disagreements within the team as, on what is working, what is not. And um, yeah, I think in general, when you're losing, you know, first of all, losing feels really bad, and then having to to work out all the issues naturally creates tension. I think that's yeah, I don't think that's uh, avoidable. And and do you resonate with that, uh, Blippo? I think I have a bit of a different perspective. I feel like it's more about what could you have gotten? I feel like a lot of teams get trapped by this, right? For example, us last play, we're like, ah, but if we won this one game, we gotta go top two if we yeah. beat them in the tiebreaker or anything like this. And I feel like that can happen to a third place team, that can happen to a fourth place mm -hmm. team. They're like, oh, if we got third place, or at least I've got to have the seating, right? Oh, maybe that game would, could have been better. And then the problem with that is, is that the negative feelings of that game resurge. Right? They come back, you remember, why did we actually lose that game? Oh, because this guy, ah, uh, okay. You know, and then you're going into a very negative mindset because, well, yeah, you did lose that game for a reason and the blame comes back rather than just being, well, you, you, you stop turning the page. You, you, you go back and that's negative for almost everybody. And in general, as long as a team doesn't fall into that trap of maybe we should have gotten third or second or whatever, I think the negative emotions are easily... Well, removed. And I, and I come from a region that plays best of threes, where if you have a bad game one, you just kind of say, okay, right, we'll just, yep. you know, you lose to one of the lower teams, okay, the next two games you can yep. steady it. I imagine that if you come off a loss and say a Saturday game, and then you put all those hours into prep that don't actually have any transparency, you can't show those to the fans, that is the work you're doing, and then something happens that reminds you of that last game that Till comes in, like, it's so lopsided prep mm. to stage time that, I can only imagine the frustration that will call if the moment you start to yeah. feel the, the, the bad memories of the last time on stage. Yeah. Do you guys have any input from your, like, do you have like a sports psychologist or anything like that that helps you with dealing with these particular emotions? Actually, last split, I think one of the, the things that helped us turn the entire split around was getting a sports psychologist okay. that we luckily still have now because um, I think many of the, these outside factors are starting to finally get more attention. Um, one of them being like mental health, like um, having a sports psychologist come in and help with setting up different r routines in that regard. Like 
um, going to the gym or at least exercising in one way or another. Like there's so many outside factors that many players actually don't really pay attention to that are really important when it comes to, to keeping a good performance. And for us, having a sports psychology was, was pretty huge because we, we started having some tension in the team because as we were saying we we started thinking about why are you smiling <laughs> <laughs> we're talking so about the gym and i'm sitting here like so, so went, gym and then he looked down and then he looked you'll go next week mate don't worry about it next week don't worry <laughs> so, yeah, so, 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 me and Buffett got it we were trying to keep it under wraps <laughs> <laughs> no but i actually i actually don't know if you guys i'm like medic i used to be a doctor mm. um i, I know that how important that is to, to a positive mental health and b also keeping yourself um playing at your absolute peak performance and i think it's something that is slowly starting to creep into esports and that's really cool um i've always been a big big um advocate of physical exercise in, in esports and how that can contribute to a a a positive mindset but also just a positive way that you approach the game in general so that's obviously nice to see too um while i've got papa smithy here i'm listening i i did, i want to take this opportunity to talk about lck versus eu because I think it's no surprise that a lot of people consider Europe the best region in the world. But my question to you is, is Europe the best region, region in the world or is it just G2? Because the, that's, that's something I'm fanatic, that, right? Yeah, I'm fanatic. But obviously, but, that's, but when you look at the, actually the results in terms of international... <laughs> all right, Papa. <laughs> when you look at the results uh, internationally, like it's obviously been G2 that's dominated the, the field. Um, do you think that EU has got a lot of catching up to do to G2? I think you're probably obviously close if not you know getting towards that equal level uh or, or do you think it is that europe as a whole is, is an incredibly strong region um honestly if to answer that question i kind of want to go back to semi-finals msi okay uh, -huh. uh skt g2 i feel like in general when a best of five is played and there's three or four games there's usually a clear better team mm -hmm. when there's five games something goes down <laughs> And if we're being real, the, the winner of that that series wins the final. Almost right, right, certainly, obviously. Right? But what I'm saying is, is near the end, right? I feel like game five. When I watched that, it was the Pike top, SKT, pretty much HG2. They go Baron when they really could have just, mm -hmm. you know, pushed in the waves, mm -hmm. reset, played the map, and they probably would have won this game, right? But the panic kicks in. You're game five. You know, I'm winning this game. I'm winning the finals, right? TL just won yesterday. I'm taking that. I'm taking that first place mm -hmm. if it's coming. That's what the players are thinking, right? I'm, that's kind of what we were thinking when we were going into world semifinals. Sure. No offense to C9. Um, but that's immediately what you're thinking about. And all of a sudden, this all kicks in, right? You're like, oh. in the moment, you're like, hell yeah, let's, let's go, let's go. We just killed him, let's go, Nash. Let's go, Nash. Bam, 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 bam. And then, wait, Pike TP'd? <laughs> Everyone starts dying, and then it kicks in. It's lost. So to, an to answer that question, yes, I think G2 is the best team in the world. And with that, yeah, sure, LEC can be one of the best teams in the world if people can contest with them in a best of five, right? We haven't seen that last split. Will we be able to see it this split? I'm confident in my own team to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. But it's still something that we're yet to see, because has any team pushed G2 further than SKT? No. So in that sense, I would say Korea is quite close. And we had uh, Duke on here last week, and he was basically saying that stylistically, he thinks Europe is better than LCK. In fact, he went as far as to say LCK is two years behind where they should be in terms of how they play the game. I'm going to actually start with you, Pappas, sure. given that you're the LCK. Very inflammatory right? statement. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think it, it's it, yeah, definitely inflammatory, I guess, if you're an LCK fan. But it's an interesting topic to explore because talking to you before we even started this show, you were like, yeah, I do think LCK are a little bit slow, a little bit behind. Uh, what, what is your opinion on how LCK play versus how you've seen Europe play during your time in LEC? I think in general, there's... To me, a, a right way to play the game based on the kind of the meta and like the rules Riot set out, which kind of changes every year when they do their biggest rework. And to me, the rule is first 14 minutes are really important because there's gold everywhere. Kills, don't even worry about them. Kill those turret plates. I, I call them kind of gold pinatas. You just whack on them <laughs> and then eventually gold falls out and everyone's happy. Um, and so the slow scaling games with zero kills, zero deaths, one turret plate across two games don't make a lot of sense with the rule set, like the game has been redefined over time, ever since uh, Tracker's Knife was removed and warding was, was cut down. You can't just play the slow game and expect to win more often than not. Yep. And, but often we see Korean teams handshake and say, let's just go to late game. And that's a decision they've made. The, the one thing I'll say is that I, I think Duke's assessment is not wrong based on mm. the games we've seen since Rift Rivals, because the meta has got really slow in Korea. Uh, 35, 40 minute games are becoming yep. common, but 
if you look back at Rift Rivals, Korea was actually playing fast, kind of perceiving what they thought the Chinese teams would do, trying to adapt to a perceived meta that in the end they were able to adapt to really well, but they came straight back to playing slow. So um, it's very interesting to me. For me, like the big deal here is that I feel like even right now in the meta, if you're playing a late game comp, what's important are dragons, right? The scaling they bring are huge. Mm -hmm. The fact that they spawn a little later, but more frequently yeah, the also minutes, adds right? onto the fact that it's more an early game meta, which for me, I'm not actually sure because do Korean teams actually contest dragons a lot in the early game, or do they not? Because at that point, if you're actually contesting the dragons and that which, that's what you're focused on, it makes sense to go for a later game because of the strength of dragons. They're really strong. We definitely see sometimes teams give up drakes and sometimes lose games fighting for an ocean drake. That's right. the third yeah, spot. Yeah, yeah. So, Obviously, I, I mean, it's more, for me, it's more like how often do they contest it pre-20 minutes, right? Like, are there three dragon spawns, four dragon spawns, or is it just like yeah, maybe you'll get one or two dragons per game in an LCK game. Because that's where I'm interested, right? Because if you're going to the late game 30, 40 minutes, well, if you're, the, if you're the team with two or three or maybe four drakes, you really don't mind. There's been a lot of free stacking, which doesn't necessarily make yeah. a lot of sense. The usual meta is that whichever team's playing bot side, weak side, chucks a control ward behind the pit and then yeah, tries yeah. to hide it and then tries to not give up too much and then the rip yeah. trade comes in. But inevitably, you do see the three, four, five, six Drake games that can get really, really crazy yeah. to evaluate. Uh, there's definitely ways to get into late game, but I, I just look at G2 play and see how much they can blow up the map in the early game and really get a lot of leads in the two lanes and kind of lose the minimum in the one la lane. And I say, surely that's how the game should be played. And maybe that's just a pure analyst on the outside right. thing, but that to me looks like the same as Samsung White putting down a million control wars in 2014, <laughs> right. or SKT's Vision games in 2016 coming from behind. To me, the G2 style fits the rules a lot better than trying to force in a style that Riot said no, 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 so many times. <laughs> no. uh, I think it goes player skill too. Confidence is a really big deal, and I feel like in Korea, a lot of players have a lot of respect for each other. Sure. So, you know, are they going to pick uh, a hard winning lane and step up and slam the guy in lane like G2 does? Not always, right? And that's kind of what is necessary if you want to have those two winning lanes. You need a mid laner or, or any kind of laner, really. This is going to be like, give me the Aso, this guy's going down. Give me the Gragas, give me whatever. I'm going to solo kill this guy or I'm going to put him in the dirt. I actually could listen to you guys go on forever. <laughs> uh, uh, but I do, I do need to move on because we need to have a look at the schedule coming up tomorrow. We have got more games, believe it or not, guys. We've got a whole other day and I've talked about that big game at the end of the day, our match of the week, which obviously is G2 versus Fnatic. Other games to look out for, Misfits SK, Vitality XL, Rogue Splice and Origin Schalke. Apart from the match of the week, guys, any other game that you, from a personal standpoint, are interested in the results? OG Shock. I agree. I think this will set the tone for who's going to be the runner-up to Splice, right? I think that's a, yeah. a pretty fair call. I'm holding out my hand as someone who kind of believes in where XL is going right now. They're on sure. a 3-0 streak. Vitality also coming off a couple of victories recently and kind of a, a come from behind game, which hasn't been yeah. their MO. Yeah. So that's actually one like, from what you guys kind of have felt around there without leaking anything, like, what are you feeling like XL versus Vitality? Like tomorrow, best of one. Uh, I was thinking the same. This, is, this match is really interesting as well because both were looking um, pretty poor in the beginning of oh, the yeah. split, but now they're actually starting to, you know, get things working and get things back together, right? So I honestly think this one can go either way, but I would probably give a small, a small edge to XL despite Vitality actually beating G2 today. It's interesting for the fans, I think. It's going to be a bloody game. We're going to see who's going to fight for that sixth place, right? More often than not. Uh, which is why, again, my eyes are more on the higher-end games. But that's because of, we're worried about yeah, what right team is there. going to contest us, right? Yeah. But in general, I think it's going to be an interesting game to watch and to see who can actually keep the trend, right? Who's going to keep winning? Are they going to be able to bring back the elements that make them win? And then it becomes interesting, right? Because when you match up against them, you're actually going to have to prep for that. And I yep. feel like that's a big deal that a lot of teams that kind of disrespect going later on into the season is like, oh, we have, let's say, G2 XL or we have G2 Vitality. Let's focus all the prep on G2 and then, wait a minute, guys, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> when are we getting the, the, the Papa Bwipo podcast? Because uh, I feel like you guys could literally talk about anything and just <laughs> bounce off each other all day. I have, to, I have to call it close there, though, guys. It's been a really fantastic PGL. And whilst League of Legends is done tonight in Europe, LCS Academy is starting mm. soon. Team Liquid is taking on... Stop, stop with the hums. Team Liquid <laughs> is taking on TSM in their quarterfinals. After that, you can catch the games that you missed today on our rebroadcast. So we will be back tomorrow. It will be a huge set of games.
culminating with that final game of Fnatic versus G2. Week seven of the LEC. Ready check starts at 4.30 CST. See you then. Take down Shulker. 